Welcome to Public and Private Passions, a documentary series on artists and artisans living and working in Haverhill, Massachusetts. Hi, I'm your host, David Zoffoli, Executive Director of Creative Haverhill. Like every town and city, Haverhill has a vibrant community of artists and artisans that make up a creative workforce. These are professionals in a variety of fields, marketing, architecture, design, performing arts and music, visual arts and crafts, film, gaming, publishing, and cultural preservation. You may be familiar with some of these folks, and there are others who, for one reason or another, have mostly kept their talents hidden from the public eye. You'll find out why. One thing for sure, public and private passion for the arts, all around. In public and private passion, we'll take a behind-the-scenes look at the passion that drives people to make something from nothing. It's a first-hand look into the creative process, and fortunately for us, creativity is everywhere. Stop what you want. I'll scream. Go ahead, scream. You like to play rough? Let's play. Absolutely. This time you're not coming up from behind me. Due to the following graphic nature of this program, you decided to interrupt this broadcast. Programming will resume in a more civil manner, shortly. Thank you. Hi, here we are at Cakes by Aaron on Canoza Avenue in Haverhill. If you haven't been here, you gotta stop in. They are doing the most creative cake decorating in the region. It's great, can't wait to sample this. Uh, today, we're here to talk about Wild Beagle Productions, the local film company started by two entrepreneurial Haverhill residents, John DePew, and Judy Coleman, who happen to be married. They also own a medical billing company, which is their day job. So here's the story of two people with a private passion who are beginning to live their dream. In its very brief history, Wild Beagle has produced three feature films. The most recent is Final Shift, now available in stores. I told them I'd say that. They're also working on a web TV satirical news show called Viewpoint 360, which they say is a cross between The Office and 60 Minutes. Wait till you hear the story of how this film production company got its name. Well, that's an interesting story. We were sitting around trying to come up with a name for it. And I had all of these names going in my head. And we have a little dog. Her name is Cassie. She's a beagle. She kept jumping up and down, kept jumping up and down, and finally Judy goes, why don't we name it Wild Beagle Productions? And I thought, yeah, that's the name. <laughs> we started and sat down, and when Judy said, go ahead and do this, that was the happiest day of my life, number one, because this is all I want to do. That's what I thought. Wild Beagle actually started when um, I have been acting for about, oh God, 10, 15 years. And I had gotten this idea for a film and uh, wanted to do it. It was called 27 Down, which was our first film. And I had this company that wanted to do it, went out and worked for them, weren't really thrilled about the way and the process. Came home, we had dinner one night, and I said to Judy, you know, I don't know if I feel comfortable with giving up this story to this company. And Judy said, let's do it ourselves. You know enough people out there. So we went out, we found an editor, we found a photographer, uh, a DP, and we put together a cast and a crew, and that's how we shot the first film. I knew a guy like you once. Don't waste your time with me, all right? What's it to you? Let's just say I'm interested. Look, I messed up, all right? Just leave me alone. Do you like puzzles? Because, man, I'm addicted. You know, I just can't get enough of them. Like this one. What's a seven-letter word for miserable? 
Oh, wait, wait, I got it. G I B B O N S. Gibbons. You're a real comedian. First one was um, not too bad. First one was probably about $30,000. We own our own business, an another business, and as business owners, hadn't taken a vacation for probably about 10 years. So I said, I've been saving a little money. So I think we can do it on our own. And then we decided, you know what? Halfway during it, we thought, you know what, this is what we want to do. This is what we want to do. Um, when we put out the shingle and we put out the first audition notice, I think we had in the movie 50 parts. And we probably got 60 to 70 people that came out and auditioned that first time. A lot of it was shot right here in Haverhill. We shot, uh, with the exception of one scene, we needed a town to shoot in a, a, a street. Uh, Air Mass was gracious enough to let us come down there and they would block off a city block for us. And so we got to shoot down there. With each progressive movie, more people came out. I mean, I believe that the reason that is is because people began to understand or like the way we made movies, which was just like we do our other business. You treat people with respect, you pay your actors, you pay your crew, uh, you keep it to reasonable hours, and you work professionally, and you have fun. But I think the main thing is just really respecting each other. Yeah, okay. You're right. I think a lot of the people who came to work with us were rather surprised. They're used to having a call time of eight in the morning even if they weren't due to be shot in a scene till four in the afternoon and just having to sit around all day. And I'm a big organizer and planner. And I said, okay, let's plan. If you're gonna shoot this many scenes in the morning, then this person doesn't have to show up till one o'clock and we'll get them the makeup and get them ready. And we learned a lot with the first movie because I knew nothing about it. I had never even been on a set before. And I think we all learned to wear a lot of hats and one of the things that um, was our mantra wherever we went was that everyone helps with everything and we leave a place cleaner than we found it. Towards the end of the movie, everyone in the crew and cast were um, chanting those mantras and um, each movie we made got closer and better and we got better at it. And we got a couple of write-ups in the Haverhill Gazette and the Andover Townsman and I was just trying to spread the word and you know let people know we existed. Yeah, we got a write-up all right. <laughs> Made the news, too. <laughs> well, we were shooting a scene, in, um, and it called for robbing a mini store. You don't want to do this. And we found this place down in North Andover that we were going to shoot in. And during the scene, uh, the North Andover police came in, thought it was a real robbery, handcuffed both the actors, put them on the floor before they realized we were shooting a film. It was a misunderstanding. But ABC, NBC, CBS all got a hold of it and they all wanted to do an interview. And uh, a lot of my friends in the business said, hey John, any publicity is good publicity. <laughs> is it worth it? I had, um, I basically, I was the executive producer, but I was also <clears throat> The production manager, the um, I oversaw the makeup people. It was my job to get everyone in the makeup chair and out on time to have all the props to make sure everything was ready and get all the PAs and just make sure everything ran smoothly and when it was supposed to and that John as the director had everything he needed and our DP had everything he needed and um, feed everybody. For actors, they just eat a lot of food. Um, snacks and coffee and lunch and um, when to have the breaks and just make sure you have you know everything um, you know, tonic and soda for people and water and it's just um, kind of being a mother to about 28 people and taking care of everybody. Fine. We can take them. Go get them. The four of them. Benny. The two of us. Director, co-producer, um, and um, helping out with the writing of the script. 
were my main three topics. It wasn't until my second film that I even used my acting skills in it. It was just at the end of the film. But other than that, it's just writing, directing, and helping out with the production of it. Haven't I taught you anything? Be patient. Watch. Assess, Assess. the situation. I know. And in fact, the, the last two films we've done have distribution, which is the hardest part of this business. It's easy, I don't want to say it's easy to make a film. Um, I think the most fun part about it is actually filming it. The next part is, and it's what we agreed that we wanted to do was, we, I'm sort of the artistic one in the family, and Judy has the business head. And um, when we made the movie, we didn't want to make it as a hobby, we wanted to make it as a business and to succeed at it. And um, Although we didn't do much with 27 Down, it was a great learning experience. Um, but we're still trying to shop it out there. CO2 uh, has sold in several foreign countries now with no name actors in it. Um, and we've actually seen revenue stream coming in from that one now. And then um, the final shift, uh, we were approached by Blue Hemisphere 3D out of San Francisco. And um, they want to distribute the film for us and they want to turn it into a 3D production. So, and that's going to be available in September, I think, out in the, you'll see it in wherever they sell 3D TVs, you're going to be able to see the final shift. Well, first of all, we live in Haverhill. Second of all, it's been really good to us as far as, far as finding locations. Our current film, Final Shift, was shot at a place called Al's Diner, right on Primrose Street. And it had just closed, and we had that place for, what, close to three months? March through the end of May, so yeah, every the, weekend we had it, and um, ninety percent of the movie was shot yeah, in that yeah. diner, and uh, they were great. And there were other locations in Di in Haverhill where we were able to acquire places. In fact, uh, CO2 was shot almost primarily in Haverhill, and it wasn't till then that I realized how big Haverhill actually is, and how many different types of locations you can find just in this city alone. And most of them were outside, and we needed different looks because they were traveling through a town. And so we had um, hills and valleys and bridges and all kinds of things. And uh, all of that was shot in Hazel. Final Shift is a story uh, was primarily um, written about a, an aging hitman and um, a genetically altered young woman. And. Uh, they alter her to be a shapeshifter. And she's also very strong and very fast. And they meet under um, unusual circumstances. He's hired by, by someone to actually steal this formula. In the process, he helps rescue her out of this place that she's been placed in. And it's really the story of their relationship and uh, how they develop a friendship through this five year to 10 year period. Um, and the purpose of the story, or the reason I was writing it, or what I was trying to say in it, is that um, you could take two people from opposite ends of the spectrum and develop a relationship that most people would look at the two people and say, these two people would never go together, and um, form a kind of friendship that is drawn by mutual experiences and circumstance, and how that gets drawn together. Which is why we're not going to move until the situation presents itself. Now, assess. A uh, web series uh, just getting off the ground called Viewpoint 360, which is a cross between 60 Minutes, Saturday Night Live, and The Office. That's actually filmed in Danvers at the uh, local high school. They have a newsroom in there, and it's a political news show. And I play this guy, John Ryan. And um, my partner and the actual producer, the Bob Gialotti, um, wrote and directs it and actually stars in it, and he's to the extreme left. And we actually put him in a smaller chair. <laughs> and it's really hilarious. Uh, if you get a chance, it's going to be on YouTube, and it already is on YouTube with several. And we're adding other cast members right now. Welcome to Viewpoint 360, where we go round and round until we get it right. Family. Sexy. Ego. Oops. <laughs> Laughter. Shoot. The 
sound of Judy's laughter. Crying. The sound of my dog barking when she's sitting in the back of my car, right behind my head. Setting out to do something and accomplishing it. Making films and acting in them. Hitting roadblocks every which way because of ego. Failure. Dog trainer. I might like to try stand-up comic if I had the courage to do that, which I don't. <laughs> Probably stand-up comedian. <laughs> least like to attempt. There's a lot of stuff I would least like to attempt. Probably car salesman. I actually did it at one point, sorry. Good job. Do it again. <laughs> That's the best yet. <laughs> Thank you, folks. What is your favorite word? My favorite word? Um, create. What is your least favorite word? I'd have to say... No. What turns you on? Beauty. What turns you on? Lack of beauty. What is your favorite sound? Pipes on motorcycles. What profession, other than your own, would you most like to attempt? Acting. What profession, other than your own, would you least like to attempt? Politics. If heaven exists, what would you like to hear God say when you enter the pearly gates? What would I like? If God say, if there is God, right? Uh, welcome. So here we are tonight, we're doing a little uh, photo shoot uh, with two of the people that will be starting the next segment of the uh, Creative Haverhill Passions in People. Stop. Tonight, we're on the streets of Haverhill with photographer Don Toothaker. We have the added bonus that he's shooting his first portrait, and the portrait is of Renaissance man Paul Frew. Let's join him. First time I ever picked up a camera, I was uh, I was a pretty young boy. I used to go to hunt drug with my father, and I would look through the glass cases at all the Leicas that uh, Mr. Farber used to sell. And I knew nothing about them, I just knew I liked them, and I thought they were pretty cool, and I aspired to have one without knowing what they cost or even how to use one. And then 
in a family I grew up in, uh, if you needed something, it was provided. If you wanted something, you better go cut a few more lawns and rake some leaves and save your money. And I, at one point when I showed an interest in photography, they gave me a little Kodak 110. I was probably 10. That was my very first camera. I still have my first picture. I took a picture of my G.I. Joe and it's American Jeep on the, my mother's garden. And um, first time I ever did that, I was like, that's, that's kind of cool. I like that. Taking a, pressing a button and then getting something back was kind of neat. So, and, and from the first sound of a real shutter, that cl clunk, I was addicted. It's real world. I think Cable's done a great job, particularly over the past decade, of, of revitalizing itself. I understand Haverhill's history and it's always metamorphosized itself as it went along and grew into its role and outgrew its role and grew into another role and that's just the way the world works for everything and everybody. Change is good, change is necessary. I like watching, I like going through downtown now and it's kind of neat to watch it go down and, and change and so as I roam around and learn, learn more about my city I like seeing it and being part of its change and, and if I can document that in some way and even just for myself, then I cool. like that. So, let's see what we got. You stay right there for me. We're going to do this in a series of a couple here. Let's see what we got. That looks good. A self assignment, I think, is necessary for an artist, and time is always of the essence and nighttime is a great time to get out and shoot and it just so happens it's the least amount of impact on anybody's schedule. So when I'm home here I can just say like hey I'm gonna run downtown and, and uh, do photography for an hour. I get to practice my craft, I like night photography, I like low light photography, I find it very very exciting and different and it all lends back to just me going out exploring you know the town and at the same time getting to practice my craft. So once I kind of started getting into it I was kind of like hey I've Feel like I've got a pretty good little project going on here. I gave myself the self-assignment of going out once a week and shooting and even if it was just for an hour I'd come back with some stuff and I just realized I got pretty excited about what I was coming back with that I had this little thing going on and I wanted to do it only at night I want to do it only in black and white because color can be distracting not I'm not strictly a black and white photographer but color can be distracting and I think it takes away from the pulse black and white just kind of strips it down to buildings and change and, and, and light um, and, and texture and I like that detail far more than uh, just color. There you go. <laughs> be you man, just be I wish you had your, you have, you always wear that, that uh, I love that like French beanie you wear. That I get all your looks for it. <laughs> I'm looking for a white tank top, he said I'm like, I'm not going to wear a white tank Oh yes you should have. <laughs> you know, like five years ago baby. <laughs> First and foremost, I'd say like the LCD screen on the back is just an amazing invention. You have an instant Polaroid on the back of your camera. So I have to take a portrait of you right now, I would know instantly. Right away I have all the answers are right in front of me if I was successful or not. Mm -hmm. And you can make, the, the key to being a good photographer um, is learning how to make very quick adjustments in the field and adapt to that. You know, the cameras are so good nowadays that they're making a lot of people into photographers that I would wish it upon anybody and everybody to explore it as a hobby, but not everybody can or should be a professional photographer. I think what separates them is the ability to, to understand how to make adjustments in the field right away based on your LCD screen and based on the histogram. If you understand that data, you can adjust immediately and keep on shooting and be successful. Whereas when you do see some stuff that's maybe not done very thoroughly, it's because they don't understand how to make those adjustments with the camera. They're letting the camera do all the work for them. So learn more about your camera. I, it, I, I say it all the time. Is, I mean, I can go down to Home Depot and buy a $5,000 saw, but that doesn't mean I can build a house. The more you understand about your subject, the better opportunity you have to, to photograph it or capture it. 
but I think I have a good eye for composition. I think it's just natural for some people that some things work pretty well in your head and some things don't. And when I go downtown Haverhill, I might walk by the same scene 10 times before maybe I catch it on that one particular night when the light's different. Or maybe somebody walks by and I notice a, a window or whatever it might be for the first time. And I think that's one of the really neat, rewarding things about photography is that you can go back and photograph the same subject over and over and over again, and it's never really the same. When I teach, I, I do my best to be a proponent of treat it like film, shoot everything like it's film. Don't waste your shutter, you know, don't just click away because you can. Treat it like film and spend more time being a photographer and less time being a computer operator. And that's probably my biggest challenge is I'm colorblind, so trying to print at home is a challenge, trying to color correcting can be a challenge. You learn tones more than colors and so again, that's another little thing that, you know, lends me into the black and white. Yet, Software is a necessity of digital photography, so that's probably the biggest technical challenge. You know, if sometimes you shoot something for, you know, six minutes, eight minutes, 12 minutes, you gotta figure that out, your camera's gotta figure it out. Most things I shoot, there's enough light downtown that it's 30 seconds or less, and your camera does, the metering system on the cameras is so good that they do a great job. You just have to understand when to underexpose or overexpose. And, that's a technical thing that you just learn in time by redundancy of doing it over and over and over again. It becomes a little self, you know, uh, second nature, if you will. The way when you're walking around like it's pitch black, you know, how am I going to photograph this? I cheat, so to speak, and I think a lot of night photographers do. I bring a flashlight, the uh, H.R. Sawyer bicycle shop, which I just think is a neat place. And, and I pass it. Anybody that lives in Haverhill has passed that a hundred thousand times. And, so it made me want to go back and photograph it, but I couldn't photograph one side of it because it was pitch black, so I just used a flashlight to illuminate it during the 20 second exposure and paint with light, because that's exactly what photography is, painting with light. My first question all the time to everybody is, what are you gonna do with your photos? If, you're, if your goal is to print them and hang them on your wall, there's a certain type of camera that needs to be used for that, an SLR, because that's gonna give you the best results. If it's just gonna go on Twitter or Facebook, it's going to be this big, desaturated, and, and resized. It, you don't need a big, fancy, expensive camera. So that's my first question back to the people is, is, what are you going to photograph, and what are you going to do with them? And I kind of put it back on their court to let them think about it a little bit. And so, you know, if somebody came in and said, you know, I want to take pictures of my kids, and, and I, I tell them, you know, get an SLR because it's going to be faster. You're going to be able to shoot sporting events. It's going to be better in low light. And, you don't need to spend a lot of money anymore. It used to be that you had to spend thousands of dollars on cameras and lenses and, and the mixture of things that go with it now, software and computers and things like that. It all blends into one pretty big expense, but you can keep it pretty moderate now. I mean, it's all relative. I mean, you know, a couple hundred bucks is a lot of money to me still and always will be. Um, but you can, you can buy a great camera setup now for $500 and really, really go do a lot of great work. Favorite word? Um, possible. Not possible. The sound of a shutter. The clickety click of my Nikon camera. Anguish, pain. Exploring, seeing, knowing, learning. Not being allowed to do any of those. I want to be a teacher of some sort. And I'm very happy to say that I am with my, my workshop stuff. So I get to, that's actually kind of a, I have a twofold career. So I'm actually kind of, if not then, probably a professional athlete. Left wing for the Boston Bruins would be nice. It's hard to say because I've had a lot of different jobs. I've been very proud of I've worked construction. I've worked in higher ed. I think any job that wouldn't allow me to meet people 
I like people. I need to be around people. So any job that forbid me or prevented me from meeting people would be bad. Did he appreciate it that I try to do a pretty good job? Thanks for joining us. Part of what we do at Creative Haverhill is to identify, nurture, and promote our local talent. They make up today's and tomorrow's creative workforce that helps drive economic development. Throughout history, artists have always led the way in changing society, and Creative Haverhill is leading that charge. You can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube. Just type in Creative Haverhill. you find us everywhere. Have a creative day.